Okay, so welcome everybody to the information session for the Department for International Trade and the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and just, you know, the acronyms for those are DIT and FCDO. Uh, I'll put those in the chat, actually. I am Marnie Smith. I'm the Assistant Director of Graduate Career Services at the Mark School at Baruch. And with me is my colleague, Suzanne Grossman, who is the Deputy Director of Career Services and Alumni Relations. Um, we have our esteemed panelists with us today, and I'm really going to let them introduce um, themselves, but we've got, but thank you, Nathaniel, Ananda, and Ben for being here. Um, so let's kick it off. Nathaniel, um, who really helped me so much in organizing this, first of all, special thanks to you. Um, maybe we can start with you, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, including your name, your title, where you work, and your connection to Baruch. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Marnie. So uh, my name is Nathaniel Sears. Um, I am the Vice Consul uh, for Advanced Manufacturing and UN Procurement at the uh, Department for International Trade, which is the UK's economic promotion agency, uh, based in New York, temporarily remote, uh, as I think most of us are. But um, yeah, typically working at the, the consulate, which is uh, just down the street from the UN. I'll pass over to Ananda. I Sorry, understand. I already messed up. Apologies. Uh, current group <laughs> student uh, in, my, in the MI program uh, set to graduate hopefully this December. So currently working on my capstone. Oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. And thanks, Marnie, for uh, putting this all together. So my name is Ananda Siram. I uh, worked at the British consulate and for um, in September was five years now. Um, and I work uh, in the political press and public affairs team at the British consulate. And my role is public diplomacy coordinator. Um, my connection with Baruch is uh, a little bit different from this group. Uh, I actually got my undergraduate degree there and got um, and actually started at the consulate um, at an internship that I found um, through Baruch. Um, all right, I'll pass it over to Ben. Thanks very much, Ananda, and uh, thanks to Marnie and Suzanne um, and to the Mark School um, for inviting us today. Um, and uh, welcome to all the participants. Um, my name is Ben Roberts. Um, I'm a senior policy advisor um, in political section um, at the uh, UK mission, the permanent mission to the United Nations. Um, and uh, we all work in the same building um, on different floors. Um, right near the UN, um, so just off First Avenue. Um, and uh, my connection to Baruch um, is familial. Um, so my wife is uh, a professor of history um, in the Weissman um, School, um, where she's been for um, about six, six or seven years, um, and is the reason why, why I came over to the States um, in the first place, but I, I can go into that more. Um, in a minute uh, when I tell you a little bit more about my work. Um, so handing, handing back to Marnie. Okay, awesome. So before we go any further, you know, we're doing this joint session with Department for International Trade and Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Can you guys explain to us, because you are all colleagues, but you, you work in different sections, how, how do these um, offices work together? Um, what is the connection there? Yeah, it's a good question. As I just said, uh, we're, we're, we're co-located. Um, we haven't always been, um, but uh, certainly um, the permanent mission to the UN um, and the consulate are basically offshoots of uh, the British Embassy Washington, which is our, which is our embassy to the United States. Um, and um, the permanent mission to the UN um, is um, the UK's permanent representation at the UN. Um, we have various consulates across the, the US, um, in addition to um, the main embassy in Washington. Um, one of those is in New York um, because of its uh, strategic importance uh, for us as a, as a, as a business center um, and um, as uh, the US's largest city. Um, and then, you know, our relationship with uh, the US um, is also a trading one, and that's where Department for International Trade comes in. So 
uh, Nathaniel can correct me on this, but um, Department for International Trade is a separate department from um, our kind of diplomatic relationship with the US, um, which Ananda and I fall into. Um, and um, actually, I, I fall into yet another um, bracket within the Foreign and Commonwealth um, and Development Office, which is um, within our multilateral department. Um, but the Department for International Trade is, is really our, um, is our, is our trade link to the US um, and, um, and, and, and forms the basis of our discussions on, on trade interests both ways, um, which I'm sure Nathaniel can, can, can talk more about in a minute. Um, so that's the link. We're all kind of part of the same, um, we're, we're all part of the same government. Um, Nathaniel's part of a slightly different department, um, but we're all pulling in the same direction, hopefully. Yeah, and just um, to go off of what Ben said, so he obviously with the UK mission to the UN is more multilateral um, and the consulate in New York is bilateral. So the re relationship with the United States. And so the even though we're called the British consulate in New York, actually our patch is wider, wider remit. So we'll cover, we obviously cover New York, we cover New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania, and also Western Connecticut. So basically, it's the, our wide range of, you know, political, commercial, cultural, security, economic, all of the different um, relationships with the U.S. and then local state governments, we'll work with them um, on. And so the Foreign Common and Development Office, you know, covers all of that. And so you'll see that in my team, which is the political press, public affairs and prosperity team. Um, but then we also are supporting British nationals um, if needed. So we have a consular team that will work um, with British nationals if, you know, they need certain services like, you know, emergency passports, um, things like that. Uh, and then we also have our devolved administration, which is different from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. But, you know, we have our, our smaller teams that cover uh, Wales uh, and Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, and then a big part of New York is um, our Department for International Trade. Um, trade is, uh, New York City is such a hub for business. And so we do get um, a lot of engagement uh, out of the um, GIT team in New York, which I hand it over to Nathaniel. Sure, thanks, Ananda. Um, so yeah, the Department for International Trade, uh, as has previously been mentioned, is kind of our international, um, or our, our sort of business development uh, wing of the British government. Uh, we were UK trade and investment up until um, 20, I think 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, so we kind of sat between um, two different departments. We were kind of, uh, you know, neither department, but both at the same time, uh, following the UK's decision to leave the European Union, um, there was increased emphasis on um, sort of trade promotion and also trade policy. So of course, um, the EU would previously manage all of our sort of free trade agreements or preferential trade agreements. Uh, some of you guys are probably studying uh, in trade policy right now. Uh, that's now sort of been devolved to the British government again for the first time in uh, 40 some odd years. So. Uh, that kind of has fallen to us, um, as well as our general trade and investment work. Uh, we consider it prosperity, uh, which is basically um, jobs and growth for, for the UK economy. And that's sort of what we're tasked to in a, a really broad sense is bringing that prosperity to the UK. Um, I'll jump into a little bit more um, of my role specifically once we, we go through that bit. But um, our, our patch is somewhat uh, broader for mine specifically. I cover Boston, uh, our Boston consulates in New England as well, uh, as, and uh, Washington DC. So a bit more um, travel sort of between those regions and, and working closely with the um, FCDO teams in both of those consul or the consulate and the embassy as well. Um, but yeah, we have teams sort of across the US. Uh, we work very closely uh, with our sort of sector teams. So rather than being um, a sort of, a, broad support for, for, um, for government generally. We sort of are divided. I work within the advanced manufacturing team. We have life sciences teams, energy and environment, um, and tech as well. So uh, I'm within the advanced manufacturing team working with colleagues across the US, um, both supporting US companies looking to expand into the UK, um, which we provide sort of free service to assist them with that process. And then we also support exports. So any British company looking to sell into the US, um, we, we provide assistance to that. Um, and including in my role, it's a bit strange, we also cover the UN. So any company looking to uh, win business with UN procurement division, UN development program, uh, UNSF or UNOPS, 
uh, we also provide them support um, with colleagues based in Geneva and Copenhagen. And then just also to quickly add, just because, you know, I think just from the, the hearing the three of us all speak, it seems like we all do, you know, really different work, but there definitely is, you know, room where we can work, to, we work together, especially when it comes to, you know, um, the UN and the private sector and just trying to get, you know, there are, at the end of the day, we all are still working for the, you know, British government and have the same objectives. So a big example of that will be UN General Assembly. Um, you know, there are many times where we will have events, you know, whether in the UN or out the UN with, you know, delegations and the private sector. Um, and so, you know, it seems like we're all doing different things, but again, common goal at the end uh, to promote the UK and their objectives. So we do, you know, every now and then work together. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you for that explanation. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you, kind of what led you to your current role, if, you're, if you could tell us a little bit about your professional path, maybe some of your work history, um, and how you secured the role that you have today. You want me to start, Marnie? Sure. Uh, great. Yeah, so um, my path here, um, I think uh, circuitous uh, is probably the way to, to describe it. Um, so um, my training is, is really um, as a lawyer. Um, so I, um, after I graduated, um, went and taught English for a while um, in Vietnam and Korea. Um, I kind of got a taste for um, international living. So I decided I wanted to do something professional that would give me um, the ability to um, work in the international sector, to um, do something to um, help people internationally. So I was interested in, in working towards the UN um, and I knew that the UN took on a lot of professionals. So um, I kind of wanted to get a professional qualification. Um, so my, um, my decision was to retrain as a lawyer. So I went back to law school, trained as a lawyer. In the, in the UK, in order to become a lawyer, you have to do um, two years post qualification on the job training with a, with a, with a, with a business um, or an organization. And so um, I um, applied for various, um, what they call training contracts to train you to be a lawyer. Um, and got one with, with the government. Um, and so I spent two years training with the, with the UK government um, in London um, and qualified as a lawyer, I think in 2013, um, and then spent four years post-qualification working as a litigator for our Ministry of Defence. Um, so I was doing a lot of cases for um, the UK Ministry of Defence arising out of our um, involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and, um, and then, as I said, my wife, um, who is American, um, and a historian, um, got a job at Baruch, um, and she moved over here, um, and was over here for a couple of years and we were flying back and forth to London. Um, and then I decided to move out here. So, um, I think I moved out here in 2017, um, and applied locally for a job at the UK mission, uh, to the UN. Um, so we quite often, because we're such a big mission um, and because we have a permanent seat on the Security Council, um, we take on quite a lot of locally engaged staff. We're kind of unusual in that, in that respect. Um, I think if you looked at the French, um, the US missions, it's, it's much more um, limited to nationals of France or the US um, if you were going to work in, in political section. Um, which works on the Security Council and things like that. Um, but at the UK mission, we, we seem to take on a lot of um, nationals from Canada, the US, um, to work in, in very prominent diplomatic roles. So I work in political section, um, which is um, the section of our um, mission to the United Nations, which works on Security Council matters predominantly. Um, and we kind of have oversight over um, the kind of political strategy um, for the UK mission um, and um, I, when I joined the mission um, my role was um, to deal with matters on the Security Council um, to do with Mali and the Sahel 
um, and uh, the conflict that's going on there right now, um, and to work on children armed conflict, um, which is um, one of the um, items on the agenda of the Security Council, which is to protect children in conflict um, and to hold parties accountable for um, violations of international law um, with regard to children um, in conflict. So uh, it ranges from child soldiers um, to um, abduction of children, trafficking, things like that. Um, and then um, about two and a half years ago, um, I moved to work on Syria. So I currently am um, the uh, officer at the mission responsible for um, the UK's um, role on Syria um, in the Security Council. Um, and, um, and then also um, I'm responsible for um, what we call the Brit British Indian Ocean Territories, um, which is um, some islands in the Indian Ocean, um, very close to Mauritius, um, which are currently contested between the UK and Mauritius, um, and um, where there is a large US um, base, um, military air base, um, which we are leasing to the US. Um, so I'm responsible for that, that issue as well. Um, in terms of what I do day to day, um, so um, my role as as Syria lead at the UN at the UK mission to the UN is to um, is to is is to draft um, statements for the ambassador for the Security Council. Uh, so under normal conditions, um, pre-COVID, that meant uh, drafting interventions um, and then sitting behind uh, our ambassador to the UN. Um, in the Security Council to answer questions, to take notes, to, um, to, to, to speak to members of other missions about um, what was gonna happen during the meeting, um, to negotiate press statements which are adopted by Security Council members, to um, negotiate Security Council resolutions. Um, and then my role is also to report back to um, the policy lead departments in London um, on what's happening in New York, um, what the political dynamics are, uh, our view of what the geopolitical, um, uh, what, what, what the geopolitical um, uh, kind of elements of, of what we're doing here are and how they play into our policy as a whole in the UK. Uh, so I'm quite often um, part of policy discussions um, with colleagues in London, in Beirut, where we have our Syria office, um, and discussing how we take forward um, our work on Syria, what to do about the conflict there, um, what to do about our humanitarian resources, um, and um, and I'm also, you know, in discussion, as I said, with, with colleagues from other missions, um, particularly amongst the permanent three, as we call them, which is the like-minded members of the permanent members of the Security Council. Um, so that's the UK, France, and the US about um, common direction. Um, and then we sometimes, you know, meet with the P5, as we call them, which are the five permanent members, which are the P3 plus Russia and China. Um, to discuss uh, Security Council matters. Um, so that's it kind of uh, in, a, in a very um, quick uh, and, and brief brief way. Um, I'm happy to answer questions later um, on specifics. Cool, quick, quick follow-up question for you, Ben. Do most people who have your position have a JD or not necessarily? No, not, not necessarily. So um, in, my, in my position are a mix of what we call UK-based diplomats. So those are people who come out from the UK as um, on diplomatic passports um, and um, are kind of career diplomats. Um, and then, as I said, because we um, have a permanent role on the Security Council and we cover a lot of ground, um, we also hire um, locally engaged staff who come from all sorts of backgrounds um, with different areas of expertise. Many have worked in non-governmental organizations. Um, others have worked in government before in the UK or elsewhere. Um, others have worked for think tanks. Um, it's, it's, it's people who have experience in the international sector, um, however, or, or, in the or, or in the governmental sector, in the public sector. Um, However, um, how, however, however, people get that experience, um, it's, it's all relevant. 
Um, so, so no, it's not necessary to have a JD. Um, I think I'm probably the only one that does um, in political sections. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Very unique skill set to have. Okay. Um, Ananda and Nathaniel, we'd love to hear more more from you about your your path and your roles. Sure, happy um, to go next. Yeah, so uh, again, I may be probably a little different um, than most, but I, uh, so I was doing my undergrad at Baruch, so uh, at Zicklin School of Business, uh, my major was Industrial Organizational Psychology, and then my minor was Law and Policy. Um, actually focused more on constitutional law, but Capstone was related to international women's law and policy. So that's where I started to get a taste of just the international relations side. And it's something just personally that was always interested, uh, interesting to me, but didn't, you know, I don't know, I just didn't think that was something that I could do. Um, so while throughout my whole uh, undergrad career, I actually interned at Credit Suisse, which I'm sure some of you might know is right down the street. Um, so basically, you know, going to school and then interning part time, you know, in between uh, breaks between courses and everything, which was really great. I learned a lot and I, I focused, I was more in their tech sector and, and doing more human, ca uh, human capital work, which is really great. And I learned a lot, um, but I could tell I was lucky, you know, still an intern in undergrad that it probably wasn't something that I was interested in doing um, as a career. And so um, this is, I guess, where I'll give a shout out to you guys to use the career service uh, office. Shout out to Marnie. Um, you know, I is different in undergrad. I used um, this is called the Star Center, um, which is an acronym that I don't remember, but uh, had, you know, email alerts for them and just kept on looking at, you know, all the offers they had on their website and found an internship to uh, the British consulate. Um, and so, and this was um, in their corporate team. So something that we didn't really mention was that, you know, within the UK mission um, and the consulate, we do have a corporate services team that does all our finance, HR, you know, they're the real unsung heroes um, that especially has, during COVID has helped us all so much. Um, but yeah, so I started as an intern um, within their corporate team. And this was my senior year at this point. Um, and while I was there, uh, you know, took advantage of the, um, you know, fact that I was surrounded by a lot of people that I was interested in learning about what they were doing. So at this point, yeah, in a different team, but was able to um, shadow the public, um, the political press public affairs team, which we just call PPA. <laughs> One thing about government is we love the good acronym. Um, and so, you know, um, shadowed the PPA team, learned a lot from them. and. You know, this is something that, you know, I will say I worked really hard, but in terms of like luck and timing, it worked out really well that as I was graduating um, a position, the position that I first started um, working in opened up and I applied and, and got it. And so that was as um, the political press public affairs assistant. So that had a very wide remit of just, you know, really supporting the team, however was needed. Um, at that point, it was mainly um, with um, our events Side. So all of our um, public diplomacy events. So something that's really important with our work um, in the US and overall in all diplomatic missions is something called, I'm sure you might, some of you might know, is called soft power diplomacy. So, you know, using um, all the things that the UK is really good at to just a regular American audience, like, uh, you know, film, TV, music, you know, all of those things that we we use to engage with our contacts and our audience to, you know, really make it seem like, you know, you know, the, um, the UK is a great place to work. The UK is a great place to, um, you know, open a business. Here are all the things that we have in common and that, you know, you guys like. Um, and so just doing a lot of events in that, um, in that sense and helping cultivate our contacts and relationships relationship building. Um, and then um, that te the team, the PPA team I'm on, is also head up by our um, Deputy Consul General. So working really close with them on um, crisis work, um, which now I am, after all these years of supporting them, I've become uh, the crisis coordinator um, at 
just for New York, which I can get back to later in terms of working through COVID. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, that was my first, I guess, you know, real role other than the internship at the consulate. Um, and we can talk more about internal mobility later, but, um, you know, just from job shadowing and, and as, you know, jobs open up, really just applying and speaking to people. Um, I've done quite a few <laughs> different roles in the last five years. So um, that'll include protocol and visits. So working with the State Department and local um, security services to get um, different ministers and VVIPs um, through and working on, you know, their programs. Um, and now my current role is, um, yeah, the public diplomacy coordinator. So wide remit. Um, so I lead on, as I said earlier, soft, now I lead on the soft power work. So our arts and culture, um, I will lead on that, those different initiatives, something that has changed a lot in COVID because a big thing that I've done um, in the past for that work is the in-person um, type of engagements, whether it be, you know, film, film premieres, concerts, um, things like that, you know, we really obviously can't do now, um, trying to figure that out virtually. Um, a big thing I do also, I lead on uh, LGBTQ plus and intersectionality policy. So every year, uh, the UK marches in the Pride March in New York, um, which is you know, uh, a lot of work, but you know, once you get into it, it's a lot of fun. Um, but also, you know, obviously, I, I think uh, LGBTQ policy and, and pride, everything is more fun. But you know, there is that human rights element that we do work on. And that is, you know, um, and Nathaniel, and I worked on this, um, but mainly Nathaniel, but you know, again, this is where policy and like, you know, foreign policy and, and trade coming together, we uh, we had last year an, an LGBT uh, founders trade mission, um, which was really great because last year was World Pride. So we did a lot of, you know, work just trying to recognize the importance of LGBTQ human rights um, around the world and especially in New York with World Pride. Um, this year I did, because we had to do things virtually, you know, taking advantage and this goes into you know, working in COVID work, taking advantage of that the fact that everybody is home so you could do more things virtually with a larger audience. So something I tried to focus on this year with intersectionality is public health. Um, Cause you know, with COVID uh, people with intersectional identities were definitely impacted a lot more than, um, you know, people who, you know, didn't, who weren't um, like that. And so getting um, the CEO of the Elton John AIDS Foundation to come talk about health in a panel with the UK ambassador, uh, Dan Karen Pierce, and also uh, Phil Apoko Giamma, who is the uh, founder of UK Black Pride. So really a big part of my job is, you know, building the contacts, building the relationships, and then bringing everything together to, you know, showcase to the public, you know, all the different initiatives that the UK is doing and try to highlight that. And then also internally, you know, off uh, outside of social media is bringing those partners together to, to do things substantive. Um, and then this year, um, well, November marks a year till uh, the UK hosts the UN Big Climate Justice I mean, climate uh, change conference called uh, COP26. And so uh, a lot of people, especially my team and the PPA team, we all have objectives to work on climate change. Um, so tying into my work with intersectionality is climate justice. So where, you know, social justice, racial equity um, overlaps with climate change. And that's something that I've been working a lot on. Um, yeah, so I think I've spoken a lot, so I'll hand it over to uh, Nathaniel. Great, thanks, Ananda. Um, yeah, so uh, lots of follow up from that. Basically, an Ananda does all the really, really cool stuff. So if you ever see a really fun event we're doing, or if you see us out at Pride or anything else, know that uh, it looks seamless, but Ananda put a lot of work into it um, to, to look quite that good and quite, quite that seamless. So. Um, but on my side, on the Department for International Trade, um, how I got into the role, uh, I'd worked at the U.S. Embassy in Stockholm, Sweden back in 2012. I was in the political team and then I went back in 2014. Um, they asked me to come back sort of while a, a number of the Foreign Service officers were transitioning out. 
um, to support them um, in 2014. So I went back two years later. Um, <clears throat> and at that time, I sort of developed the US government's uh, LGBT action plan for, for the country. Um, so it was really nice that we we're able to get our, our ambassador to sort of fly the pride flag and participate in the pride march, which actually uh, I stole the idea to participate in the pride march from the British government, which was the first to actually march in pride um, in, in Stockholm for Stockholm pride. Um, so I, I shamelessly borrowed from, from the Brits for that, uh, which is kind of maybe a natural segue for me to someday join them, already, already kind of working with them back then. Um, but kind of from working there, I realized that there's this large contingent of locally employed staff uh, that work within these sort of missions and consulates overseas, um, and which I never really thought about. I, you know, you always just kind of assume these are a bunch of diplomats um, and, you know, that's kind of their world. We, you know, we can't really participate as Americans here in the U.S., but um, that's really not the case. Uh, for instance, in our consulate, uh, I think there's probably around 100 or so employees within the consulate itself. Um, and only three of those are diplomats. So we have our ambassador and we have two deputy ambassadors, or sorry, uh, consul general and two deputy consul general. So uh, outside of that, everyone else is a locally engaged member of our staff, uh, which as uh, Ben mentioned, it really speaks to the amount of seniority that's given to local staff. Um, so that's, you know, people that are working on our regionally for the sort of East and West Coast on our trade work are, um, they can be sort of local staff. We have one, one individual who is uh, still UK based or a diplomat and we have one that's a local staff member. So um, there are lots of opportunities for upward promotion, which I found really interesting, but also with that, there's lots of job opportunities. So uh, when, I, when I got back from my second internship, I just graduated uh, from University of Miami. So I was looking for jobs um, and just kind of started applying for a bunch of them at the, the British government uh, between the embassy and I was looking at the, the consulate in Miami and then the consulate in New York. Uh, and finally settled on, on the position here in New York. Um, the great thing is because it's government, it really is a, you know, it's meritocratic. It's, it's, it's about your qualifications and your ability to perform in the role. Um, so that's one of the really great things I think as well is rather than having to have connections, which is sometimes the case, especially in the private sector, um, it really is based on your ability to sort of meet the specifications required in the job advertisement um, and, and just, you know, give a, a convincing interview, which is, which is really great. Um, so I've been, I've been working for the British government. Um, it'll be six years in January. Uh, that entire time I've worked for the Department for International Trade uh, within the advanced engineering and manufacturing team, starting as an associate and then becoming a manager and now a vice consul at this point. Um, so in that role, it's sort of managing um, a team of uh, myself. I have a, a sort of direct report that supports me on my sectors and then um, Kind of a dotted line additional support from from a fellow colleague um, who supports on on some of our other subsectors um, but again it's really about bringing forward that um, that sort of prosperity platform so uh, we're based in new york uh, as i said i work in manufacturing so pre-covid it was a lot of traveling outside of new york city because believe it or not it's not very cost effective to manufacture aerospace components and things in new york city uh, so it's a lot of upstate new york travel it's philadelphia pittsburgh um, even up to Boston for some of the more um, sort of tech focused um, products that, that are manufactured maybe through MIT spin outs and things like that. Um, but it's, uh, it's now been, you know, a lot more virtual um, at this point. So the great thing about COVID is that uh, now everyone is, is sort of happy to meet virtually in a way that maybe they weren't before. So uh, I think we've probably been engaging even more with companies than in the past because uh, we can talk to a company in Pittsburgh at nine o'clock and then at 10 o'clock we can have a call with uh, their subsidiary in the UK uh, to talk through sort of how we can help them with, you know, hiring new employees or if they're looking for grants for an expansion project or something then we can sort of talk through that with them. Um, but that's a lot of what our work is. It's, it's sort of looking at our uh, new and existing investors in the US. Uh, how do we get them over to the UK? What are the sort of incentives that would drive their movement over there? Um, and for companies that are already there, you know, during COVID right now, or um, with, with sort of regulatory changes during Brexit, it's how do we keep them as informed as possible on what those changes mean for them uh, and their business? How do they continue to hire, you know, top qualified talent if they're, if they're you know, looking at an international talent base? Uh, what are the new visa re regulations and things that, that we can sort of support them with? Um, and, and that's kind of a lot of the work we do. On, on the UN procurement side, um, it's actually been quite interesting. Um, obviously COVID again has meant that there's uh, a large demand for 
testing kits, PPE equipment, uh, and again, if, at some point vaccines uh, for you know, millions of people, UN will be providing both to their staff, but also um, through UNICEF and other agencies to, to individuals in the developing, developing world. So um, for us, it's coordinating with them and making sure that they're connected with our British pharmaceuticals companies, for instance, or, or testing companies so that they have the right connections when, when they need to go forward with procuring those um, PPE or vaccines. Um, and also, as Ananda said, some of the, the working that we do together, um, there's been a big push around climate justice, which Ananda mentioned, uh, COP26 being uh, a year from, uh, a few days from now, basically. So um, with that, we've been working with some of our like-minded partner countries um, in, in Europe and Northern Europe specifically that have similar interests around um, clean growth uh, and trying to make sure that the UN's aware of you know, the sort of products that are available, how they can do procurement in a more sustainable way. Um, and if that's, you know, in the missions, or sorry, like, you know, in the missions, you know, in Mali, for instance, or in Sudan, um, you know, how are they getting water in the way that's the most sustainable? So you're not really pulling from, you know, local populations, water supplies, or if it's really hard getting uh, fuel to a site in a remote part of Mali, for instance, how can we find sustainable solutions for them if it's solar or if it's small wind or something like that. Um, so it's, it's been really interesting kind of working with them on, on those areas. Um, let's see, I also wanted to mention uh, the crisis work that Ananda brought up. So our, again, the, the work is primarily trade and investment for us, but um, as a consulate, you're gonna sort of constantly be pulled into doing other things. Uh, there's a lot of work here in the US, especially in times of crisis, for instance, uh, the teams are relatively small compared to the sizes back in the UK. So it's kind of an all hands on deck. Um, so for instance, uh, Thomas Cook was a sort of um, a travel company slash uh, airline uh, that unfortunately went bankrupt last year. Um, and at that point there was, I think over 10,000 individuals who were currently in the US on vacations who then did not have flights back home. Um, so for instance, I, I managed a team of around 22 people uh, as a crisis manager down in Orlando, Florida. Uh, getting all of those uh, Disney, you know, vacation goers back to um, back to the UK, which involved working very closely with our partners in BA and Virgin uh, uh, Atlantic, but also with um, a charter companies, uh, local government, uh, UK government around, you know, how do we get people back from a regulatory perspective um, and keeping people sort of calm at the same time. It was kind of a stressful time for everyone. Um, so we, we had that, we also had COVID where there were um, numerous cruise ships based in uh, South America that were not allowed to dock at any uh, ports in South America. Um, so they eventually had to come up to uh, Emmy. Uh, we supported the cruise lines as well as individuals on the cruise ships um, and sort of getting charter flights back to the UK, getting them access to Port of Miami to disembark and providing medical services to those that uh, unfortunately had contracted COVID um, on, on those cruise ships. So um, it's not the standard day job and it's you know a lot of kind of learning on your feet. I'd never done really any crisis manager training before uh, being shipped down to Orlando on I think about 12 hours notice. Um, so it's it, it can be a really exciting job in that sense. You're doing something different every day. Um, you know, some of the high level events again that Ananda mentioned uh, around UN General Assembly um, typically we have a VVIP if it's the prime minister, if it's another senior minister, um, there's always a, a business component to that as well. So of course they'll be doing meetings at, um, you know, sort of UN specific meetings, but they also want to engage with, uh, some of the CEOs of the larger U S corporates to talk through, you know, current UK business environment or, or whatever they're really interested in speaking to. So we've had some really great opportunities to, um, get some very senior individuals in the room kind of meeting with the prime minister. Again, it's a lot of work that goes into that, uh, sometimes over a relatively short period of time, but um, those are definitely some of the highlights of the job. I think I've been able to meet the past three prime ministers, at least for a quick uh, hello, which is uh, you know quite, quite exciting, uh, especially again, as uh, someone that was in an entry level position for about four and a half years of, of my time here. Um, it's, it's really fantastic at every level, the kind of engagement that you can have, especially if you're as much of a sort of policy or international affairs nerd as I think probably the three of us are. Um, but again, also one more thing to mention and then, and then I'll stop uh, around diversity and inclusion that Ananda mentioned. Um, the British government really takes diversity and inclusion very seriously. Um, and for a number of years now, we've had a diversity and inclusion organization um, sort of nationally where we're feeding in between all of the various consulates and the embassy. Um, that's 
you know, we've really gotten a lot of support in being able to meet, to discuss issues, to cooperate if it's around pride, um, if it's around some work that we did uh, during, you know, Black Lives Matter earlier this year as well. Um, and we've seen a lot of really positive changes from the top down um, or, or sort of initiatives from the top down from, from our ambassador in DC um, and from local leadership at, at all of the consulates. So um, they really enable us to run, run with uh, diversity and inclusion, trying to make sure that we're hiring in a diverse manner, that we're working uh, to be as inclusive as possible when we're doing, you know, networking events or, or panels, we can't have any manals, uh, which is very important. We always make sure we have gender diversity on our panels. And I think it's little things like that that sometimes organizations don't think of um, that can really make a big difference. And it's it's really nice working for an organization that um, acknowledges the importance of inclusion basically in everything we do. Thanks. Awesome. Wow, you guys are doing incredible things. Um, so, so we talked, um, a little bit. Thank you, Nathaniel, for sharing that that link for all the the postings in New York um, and in the U.S., which I which I just put again in the chat. Um, I wanted to ask about you know we yesterday had a pre meeting and we were talking about potentially there was one there was one specific opening which seemed like a really good kind of entry point. Um, in I'm wondering if we can talk about that. What that is. Um, and just for everybody, I did check um, on this link as well. And there's no internships in, in New York right now, um, but keep your eyes on this site. Do keep checking back because Ananda, as Ananda was an intern here in New York, um, they definitely do have internships. Um, so is it okay to go back to that position? What was the position that we were referring to yesterday? Um, ben, I don't know if you want to come in and this could, would be in your team if it was the political admin officer role. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, as, as, as everyone said, we, we advertise jobs globally on, on, uh, the FCDO, um, website uh which is called at, at the moment still fco.tal.net um so you can find jobs um with the uk government all over the world there um as i've said we um we uh employ a lot of locally engaged staff um in all three um parts of um our presence in new york um one job that has come up or um will have come up. Um, I can't see it right now um, on, on the site, but I understand that it's being advertised um, is the job of um, admin officer um, in political section um, in the UK mission to the UN. Um, so that that is a great position to, I think, get started in if you're interested in um, a, either exposure to international affairs or B, if you're, you know, if you're really serious about a future in, in international affairs, um, it is that the, the role is to support the, the diplomats in, in political section um, with security council work. Um, so um, really it's a, it's an admin position. Um, so making sure the team runs well, um, making sure that uh, things are recorded, making sure that uh, people are within budget um, with hosting um, people from other missions, things like that. Um, but, um, you know, as Ananda says, um, we're quite often in an all hands on deck uh, situation uh, during things like UNGA, um, during committee season, which is which is uh, the period which follows UN General Assembly week. So UN High Level Week happens every September. That's the opening of the General Assembly uh, for that year. And um, and what follows that is the committees of the General Assembly. That so it's a really busy time. Um, and so admin officers always get the opportunity during that period to attend meetings and even to negotiate on on behalf of the UK. So um, one of our admin officers in political section right now is, is negotiating um, on behalf of the UK. So representing the UK in a meeting with 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 other diplomats 
um, on a resolution being brought forward by Turkmenistan on um, the importance of neutrality of, of, of countries um, and the importance of neutral countries um, in international affairs. So, um, and you know, the admin officer has uh, great access to the ambassador. Um, we'll be speaking to the ambassador almost every day. We'll manage, help private office manage the diaries of uh, some of the senior management. Um, so th these are really great roles if um, you don't yet have huge amounts of experience um, in international affairs or um, in kind of professions, if you want to get into um, the UK mission to the to, to the UN or, or just into international diplomacy as a whole, um, and I think you know once you're in, you meet so many people um, that uh, it really opens up a whole world of, of possibilities um, and contacts um, to pursue kind of whatever avenue you want to, and 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 you know you you get exposure to to the work across across the UK mission as well. Um, so political section works on the Security Council, but we also have people that work on climate, on diversity, um, on um, things like the UN budget. So if you're interested more in finance and, and, and economics, um, we have a legal team. So there, there, there are all sorts of opportunities. Um, so I see that um, it's been put in the chat box. So that's, that's, that's the position there. And I would just say maybe quickly on um, about these positions. So that position, as well as, um, for instance, positions like a trade and investment associate for the Department for International Trade. Um, I just want to note they're they're mentioned as hourly because they're considered um, non-exempt. So basically, individuals are required to work no more than forty hours. If you work over forty hours, then uh, you'd either have to, you know, work less another day to to reach that limit, or you'd be paid time and a half. Um, so just to note those, as long as it says it's a full-time position, those are, it, it is actually a, a salaried position in all intents and purposes, as long as you're working that 40 hour amount um, with all of the benefits and things that come with full-time employment. It's just um, sort of a regulatory thing on, on our side to note them um, by the hourly rate, but you can calculate that out to the full salary uh, by just, you know, multiplying it by 40 and the number of weeks and things. Yeah, and and, yeah, I was like, and just to add to what Ben was saying, um, mainly on, you know, just entry level positions in general, but also just some questions in the chat. Um, something that's great about this website is that you can create an email alert through the website. So there'll be like somewhere, I'm sorry, I don't have the website on, like in front of me right now, but there is like a tab where, you know, it could be like send me email alerts and you can then, you know, pick like specifically, I want like jobs in New York and, and you know, as things open up, they'll, um, you'll just get an email, which is really great. Um, and um, again, as I said, totally uh, use your career service office because they'll, you know, if based on what, um, you know, you're interested in, I'm sure they'll help you out. Um, but yeah, yeah, going back to just like internships and, um, entry level positions. I know within my team, um, like you wouldn't see anything for the political press public affairs team for the consulate in New York for like right advertised right now because we mainly do a fall position. Um, so like you wouldn't see that until like the summer, um, something for us, but also depends on the workload when something big is going on, we will get, um, we will, um, try to resource temporary staff for a couple of months. And there are, um, you know, a couple of staff that we have now working permanently that one was one of my interns now actually works in the political section at the um, UK mission, which is really great. Um, and then also we have, um, you know, we had a big project, um, gosh, maybe a year and a half ago or so. And we just had someone who was there working temporarily and now she works permanently for the UK mission to the UN. So it's one of those things where, you know, you take an opportunity that you know, could be temporary. I mean, for example, me, I was only supposed to be there for four months. Here I am five years later. You, you know, I, advice I always give to our interns whenever they start is, you know, obviously you, you start with the intention of working on a project, but, you know, none of the projects that we give our interns are like exhaustingly, you know, 60 hour working projects you know there's always going to be time and we also whenever we have an intern um or someone who is entry level we always make sure um we get, get have them have their learning and development opportunities so if you know you are interested in a specific, specific topic but you're you know interning in a different um 
you know, team, like for example, when I was um, the, in the corporate services team, but was interested more in, you know, political side, I, you know, took the initiative to reach out to our vice consul who's head of political affairs and had a chat with him. And, you know, also when people have different capacities, you know, reaching out and being like, hi, I have, you know, a couple of free hours this week, if there's any projects I can job shadow or help out on, um, you know, I'd love to help out because then people recognize and see you. And then, you know, as you apply, like people would be like, oh yes, that person actually is really great. They've, you know, helped out on this, this and this. And it really helps build up, not just, you know, I think we, what, you know, we've all said it's because it's government, we're very meritocracy, you know, it's not just like, oh yeah, she was an intern, like let's apply, let's give her the position. It's, you know, yeah, she was an intern and look, I could speak to different things that I've done that made me a strong candidate. So, yeah. yeah. And then, and I think we can both speak from experience in the sense that even we've both gone for internal promotions within, uh, mm -hmm. within the, the consulate. And again, it's, it's the same exact way you're competing against uh, journals, uh, in, in the same exact way you're asked the same questions. Um, there's no special treatment. So, um, I, I think it just hopefully speaks to the fact that you, you definitely don't have to have the connections. Um, but you know, you're asked questions based on your experience. So if you do get an internship or if you're doing something similarly related in an international space, um, definitely think of those going into an interview, um, where you're going to be asked to, you know, tell us about a time that you did this or that you overcame this problem, you know, having, having those relevant experiences are really helpful in the interview process. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to quickly answer, yeah, you, um, U.S. citizens, permanent residents can apply as well. And how about international students? Yeah, so 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 on on that, um, really, the qualification is the ability to work in the U.S. for for many positions. Um, so as long as you have a visa that allows you to work. Um, or you're a permanent resident or you're a citizen, um, then, then that's what's needed. Um, there are some restrictions on um, working in the UK mission to the UN um, and particularly in political section. Um, most people need to be a member of the Five Eyes countries, which are the five intelligence sharing countries. So um, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, US or UK nationals just for security reasons, for security clearance reasons. Um, but other than that, um, the only requirement is that, you, that, that, that you're able to work here. Um, so it's not limited to US citizens. Okay, great. And Ananda, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions also from the chat. Um, one person asked if you could repeat the name of the internship that you got. And another asked if you could talk about the online test that you took when you applied for the internship. Sure. Um, so there wasn't an online test. Sorry oh. if I said something confusing. Um, I, I was more, I um, just applied, um, filled out regular application um, and all of that. I don't know if there was a confusion of me mentioning the Baruch Star Center. Um, but that's an undergrad thing. Um, so, you know, I, I guess that, yeah, no, that there was no test, just filling out a regular old application. Um, and then the other question was about what the internship was called. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the internship was called, um, I think it was, yeah, it's corporate services intern. Um, Perfect. one thing about the, um, that job site is they do lists um, explicitly what the position is. So you'll see it says internship. Um, and again, um, in my experience on my team, I've hired um, master's candidates for internships, but also for, um, as I said, the um, temporary positions that I have in my team for different projects, um, mainly because it is um, a lot of times it'll be part-time roles. And so it is great that we can have you know, someone who is, you know, going to school and then um, working. So like we know that they have um, something going on and we're always very flexible um, between hours and when they have classes and, and work due. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say don't just apply to an intern or don't just think, you know, that internship is your only option. Um, I had full, and of course, obviously Nathaniel is doing, his full-time role while um, going to school. So um, don't feel like 
you know, you're just in the box of only applying to an internship. You know, I think, as we said, the strongest candidate is the one that gets the role. So if you feel like there's a position that is open and it fits you really well, still, still apply um, and go through the interview. Because even if you don't get it, um, one thing, you know, as we said with this, this interview process is that it's very structured and we go through, um, and this is, I guess, where my um, industrial organizational psychology, like, person is very excited because we do a very structured competency-based interview. Um, and you do get materials beforehand to prep um, and everything. So it would be, I think, interesting to apply and then get through an interview stage to even just learn about how an interview like that goes um, because it is very structured um, and you do you know, have to prepare enough to learn about the competency so you can answer a question the right way. Great. And just to kind of piggyback on that um, question for everybody, which is, you know, are there are there classes that you took in school, whether at Baruch or not at Baruch? Um, are there skills that you've gained or experience that you've gained that you think made you a more attractive um, applicant to DIT or FCDO um, or just would make anybody a more attractive applicant? Like if people are saying like, what, what do I have to learn? What do I have to no, what do I have to do? What would you recommend? Um, I guess I can start off. Um, maybe just to say as well on, on Ananda's comments about the, the job and thing too. Um, just again, an, an extra little plug since I am doing both at the same time, working full time and, and doing uh, my grad program. Um, you know, they give an additional five days of study leave on top of a really generous uh, leave package. I think it starts at 18 days for new hires, uh, 14 days of, of uh, holidays or vacation days on, or sorry, 18 vacation days, 14 holidays, 10 sick days. So we're already really good. Also additional five study days uh, and some tuition reimbursement. So uh, again, an additional shout out to the ability to do both at the same time. They make it pretty flexible. Um, sorry, your question again, Marnie. Oh, it was just like, you know, are there any skills or classes or experiences that would make folks more attractive candidates? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, especially within DIT, I think um, the sort of trade policy focus is really interesting. You know, being able to discuss economics is, is always helpful. Again, this may have not been as important when I started in 2015, but uh, we're more and more having kind of a slightly more economics focused conversations especially around trade policy, we're, we're constantly talking about tariff and non-tariff barriers uh, and, and the ongoing US-UK uh, trade negotiations are, are kind of a constant area of discussion. Um, so I think that those kind of classes could be really helpful uh, from, a, from a DIT perspective. And also again, taking advantage of that required internship um, if, if it is a requirement of, of your specific um, program just looking for something that maybe has some international focus. Um, that's something that's of interest for us is knowing that you can work sort of between cultures or between countries. Um, if that's working for an NGO that has a global focus, if it's working for a foreign government, if it's working for the US government, but facing uh, an international audience or even a company where you're working, you know, um, you know you're know, you working with your contacts in, in London or Singapore, or what have you, um, definitely leverage those internships if you can. Yeah, and I would say, um, I mean, I've been on, um, I've sat on panel, interview panels for, you know, DIT and then FCDO within the mission to the UN and the consulate. And I'd say something that I always look for, you know, are a couple of things. And one is, you know, as Nathaniel said, like de demonstrating the ability to work within different cultures is really important. And so, you know, it could be, you know, yes, um, you know, you work for an international company, so you can, you know, say, oh, yeah, working with a group at a different time zone, or, you know, like the different cultural differences and navigating through that is really interesting. But then also in New York, if you have a local job, and, you know, you work with so many different people, just demonstrating that you can work through differences is really important. I think that's important and re relationship building and to being able to say that, you, you know, you understand how to demonstrate just that type of stuff um, is really, really important to me. Um, something that I would say is, um, I, I don't want to say it is not said enough, but I feel like people don't um, realize how important it is enough, but um, public speaking, I'd say, is a skill that would is really great um, for everybody. Um, 
to learn and just tackle. I know um, I am, you know, used to be very shy and, and, you know, not that kind of person to speak in front of a crowd, but it's something that I've worked on and developed. And I feel like that has really been a factor in my growth uh, throughout the consulate. Um, it's just demonstrating the ability to speak um, in front of people because, you know, at the end of the day, when in terms of, you know, our international diplomacy and engagement, you're trying to convince an audience of something. And if you can, you know, do that effectively, I think that's really great. Awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree with that. Um, I mean, I think for me, one of the most important experiences was, was teaching English um, as a foreign language. It helped me to, to understand, um, other people's perspectives, but as Ananda said, it also gave me a lot of confidence to get up in front of a group of people who were expecting me to, to educate them. Um, children, I, I taught children, which was terrifying for me. Um, and it, but it really helped with, you know, being able to speak publicly, with getting my point across, with having the confidence to do that, which is a big part of the job. But I, you know, I think I'd come back to to what Ananda um, and Nathaniel were saying about about the about the the interview process and it being a competency based process. And you're told when you apply for the job what the competencies are that they're looking for. So, you know, for my job and I'm sure for the others' jobs, one of the competencies was engaging internationally. So you'd be expected to explain in the interview what experience you've had of engaging internationally and that that can be anything um, it's really so that you can demonstrate that that you're able to meet that competency and that and that the interviewer can see you in the job uh, the entities that that are very often set out are collaborating and partnering um, delivering at pace that's kind of you know prioritizing being able to deliver things quickly um, to a high quality uh, managing the quality service um, so being on top of things and being able to um, always turn out high quality work or to make arrangements to, to ensure that that happens. So I think, you know, I'd, I'd say in terms of getting jobs with the UK government, that the most important thing is not what you know, but what you do. Um, and if you're able to demonstrate from past experiences that, that, that you're able to, to show certain skills in certain situations, whatever they, whatever they are, um, I think that's the most important thing. For, you know, for example, I once, had, I once interviewed someone who had been off work for 10 years, was a stay-at-home mother, um, and um, had not been in, in employment for, for a few years, but she was able to demonstrate that she had the skills for the job because, you know, she was managing three children. She was, you know, managing finances. You know, she was, she was, she was doing all of those things, delivering at pace, prioritizing. So I think, you know, it, it, it depends on what you do. So in terms of, I think, um, additional classes or, or classes, I think, you know, alongside that, it's really important to, to have some experiences outside of, 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 of classes and, you know, join clubs, get involved in initiatives, uh, you know, at university, I was involved in a in a free legal advice center. So, um, th those are all things which can show engagement with other people. And 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 you, I, th I think having a good broad um, range of experiences is is really is really useful in order to be able to show that you're able to do things in different circumstances um, and under different conditions. Yeah, and just um, to add to that, um, just thinking about like yeah, when you're on a panel and, and things that I look for. Um, and I'd say maybe this is a, a little different, maybe not what we plan, but just like, just talking to all you guys like in this thing, just thinking of like, I guess maybe not, I don't say mistakes, but two things that I notice a lot in interview questions that I don't necessarily, um, I feel it could be worked on. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the competencies, you know, we'll talk about, um, you know, tell us about a time when you had to manage a lot of different pieces of work, because that's one thing that happens a lot. Um, in the consulate and the mission where I think between the three of us, we all talked about like 17 different things that we're all working on at the same time, right? And so you have a lot of things you're managing at the same time. And so we, we talk, we ask that question. And um, it's, it's funny because I feel like a lot of people, when they answer that question, they um, try to demonstrate, oh, look at all these things I can do at once. But, and then we'll say, okay, well, how did you do that? And they'll just say, oh, I... I just like worked through the night or, you know, I didn't get any, you know, I did all this stuff and 
you know, you could tell you like, you know, I basically had a mental breakdown, but like that actually is the wrong answer. You know, one thing that we, um, as we talk about with diversity and inclusion, but also mental health is a big part of our work at the consulate and the mission, you know, with it internally and, and resilience. And man, one of the um, competencies actually is also demonstrating resilience. And so resilience really isn't like, and I powered through, it's, you know, actually like, you know what, I had this huge workload and I had, you know, ABC one, two, three to do. And, you know, I assessed my workload and, you know, noticed that actually, you know, Nathaniel also works on this project. So maybe he and I can work together to create a solution of, you know, sharing some, some of the burden because it's a lot, you know, like, I feel like that's a big thing that we notice is, you know, you want to demonstrate that you can work, um, through a lot of things like effectively not just I did it all it's like how did you successfully do it and one of those things is managing your own resilience and I think that's very um underappreciated and then one thing I also notice in um examples we'll also talk about big projects and you know when you're applying for inter entry level and internships you're not always you know the person leading on something and so you know I, I notice a lot of people just saying you know we not me so I think, you know, when you want to talk about a big project, you know, you can say, talk about UN General Assembly, like, I'm not the person, you know, I'm not the PM giving the speech at the, you know, the thing, but I'm also, I have like my special task. So you could talk about overall big project and say, you know, we did this thing with a delegation, but really highlight what you did and how you did effectively. Because I think a lot of people will just talk about the overall thing to sound impressive, but then you at the end of the at the end of the question you're just like but what did you do and i think that's really important because you're really selling yourself you know think about how you want to come across as a team player in a team yeah ananda we might have to have you back for an interview a uh, workshop part two. <laughs> um these are great 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 tips and um unfortunately we're over time but i feel like we could keep going for like another two hours um but thank you all so much, Nathaniel, Ananda, and Ben for being here and taking time out of your very busy day, all the 17 things that you each are doing. Um, we really appreciate your time. Um, and everybody's on LinkedIn. Um, if there are other questions, I know there are other questions in the chat. People can also follow up with me. Um, everyone should have my email. And um, thank you again to our panelists, especially for going over time. Um, we hope you stay safe and healthy. Um, and thanking, thank you for sharing your, your advice and your insights with us. Well, thanks, Marnie. Thanks for everyone for joining as well. Thanks for joining. And yeah, feel free to LinkedIn message. Happy to answer any questions in the future if anyone has. Yeah, thanks very much. And uh, I'm equally happy if uh, you want to route any questions through Marnie, I'm, I'm happy to answer further questions. Okay, thank you all again so much. I will send everybody the recording. Um, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye.